morning we're talking about from here to eternity. And I got a quick question for you. How do people picture Jesus? How do you picture Jesus? Now, I don't mean what he looks like. I mean, we have lots of paintings of what people think Jesus looks like, and they all have him with a beard, right, and dark hair, and he looks a little Jewish, in case that's a surprise to you, because he is a Jew. So we see all these pictures and stuff, but I'm not talking about what Jesus looks like. What is Jesus like in the way he treats people? The way he treats If you ran into Jesus at the mall, I mean, how would he treat you? What do you think? If he if Jesus, you know, sat next to you when you were filling out your taxes, if Jesus was there with you, you know, when you bumped your thumb with a hammer, if you if Jesus was with you all day, you know, as you're with the other people at work, how would Jesus treat you? What do you think? Would he be would he, if he looked you in the eye, what would he say? Would, would he condemn you? Would he point your finger and say, I saw that. Is, that? is that what Jesus would be like? Some people have this picture of God where God's just up there like a big ogre with a club ready to smite you. I don't even know what smiting means, but he's ready to smite you and all, and I saw what you did. Well, I got to tell you, Jesus is the least likely person to do that. It's quite the opposite. There are some preachers like that. There are some Christians like that. They're judge and jury on everybody else, but not Jesus. Jesus Jesus met a woman at a well, and he didn't bring up all her many sins. He didn't even talk about it until she brought it up to him. He met a man named Nicodemus who secretly came to see him at night. He makes a guy named Zacchaeus we're going to see today as well. Two weeks ago we saw this rich young ruler, and and he doesn't attack any of them. He doesn't point out, hey, look at this, I saw that. No, he loves them. He loves them. Now, here's part of our problem. We think that in loving people sometimes we have to approve of lifestyles that are wrong. Jesus didn't do that. Remember, there was a day when a woman was caught in adultery, and they took her outside the city. They were ready to stone her, and they wanted Jesus to weigh in, and Jesus looks at her. You know the story. He writes in the ground. Wouldn't you like to know what he wrote in the ground? We don't know. Maybe the names and the sins of all the people ready to stone her. But they drop their stones. They leave, and he says, woman, where are your accusers? And he says, they're all gone, sir. And I love what Jesus says, because he says two things. Neither do I condemn you. Ah, but wait. He also says, but go and sin no more. Oh, what a balance. Jesus loves her and forgives her. But he still says sin is wrong and you need to stop. Interesting. Jesus loves people. We're talking for these three weeks about Jesus transforming lives. And how does he do it? Not by pointing fingers in noses, but by loving people so that they want to change rather than feeling guilted into change. And that's what Jesus does. That's what he does. Now, we've been seeing for three weeks this phrase, people change, but not much. And I think that's true. The older I get, the more I think that's true. Yes, people change, but not very much, with the exception of when they meet Jesus. And then their lives can be totally turned around. With the power of God, like the song we just sang a moment ago, lives can be completely changed with Jesus' power. And not because he condemns, but because he loves. And today, we're going to see Jesus love and transform a thieving tax collector A man that everybody in town said, oh man, he's the worst sinner, but Jesus with love transforms his life. Now we're going to look at the scripture. We're in Luke chapter 19 now. I got a couple of fun things for us this morning, a couple of fun things as part of that. And the first one is how we're going to read the scripture. So this is from the contemporary English version. Uh, It's just a different translation into English of the story. So watch and enjoy. This is exactly today's passage. With an Australian accent. Jesus was going through Jericho, where a man named Zacchaeus lived. He was in charge of collecting taxes and was very rich. 
Jesus was heading his way, and Zacchaeus wanted to see what he was like. But Zacchaeus was a short man and could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree. When Jesus got there, he looked up and said, Zacchaeus, hurry down. I want to stay with you today. Zacchaeus hurried down and gladly welcomed Jesus. Everyone who saw this started grumbling. This man Zacchaeus is a sinner and Jesus is going home to eat with him. Later that day, Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, I will give half of my property to the poor and I will now pay back four times as much to everyone I have ever cheated. Jesus said to Zacchaeus, Today you and your family have been saved, because you are a true son of Abraham. The Son of Man came to look for and to save people who are lost. Isn't the Bible way cooler with an Australian accent? What a great story. Now, we're going to look at that story this morning. Before we do, let, by the way, it ends with the key verse of the whole book of Acts, right? The Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. A great verse. The Son of Man came to look for and transform the lost. Jesus came looking for us, and he wants to change us. Let's talk about a little bit about what's going on here in this passage first. If you've got the blue page ready and a pen maybe to take some notes, a couple of things that are going on. Jesus has been up here in Capernaum in the Galilee for three years ministering. But now he knows it's time to go to Jerusalem to die on the cross for us. Matter of fact, the Bible says that he resolutely set out for Jerusalem. Now, even though it's a three-day walk from Capernaum up there to Jerusalem down there, Jesus, well, he kind of takes the long route. It goes something like this. It takes him months, three months at least, maybe four, five, six months, because he's ministering to people and he's sharing with people. We had an election here in Ontario a couple of years ago, and you might remember all the parties had a bus for their leader. Remember that? And there's the big red liberal bus and the big blue PC bus and the big orange NDP bus. And, and they would travel crisscrossing the, the province, stopping in towns and having rallies saying, here's our candidate, here's our plan. And it's sort of what Jesus has been doing as he travels around and, and, and here's the kingdom of God and he's telling people, here's who I am. And, and he's teaching and casting out demons and healing. It's, it's been amazing, the ministry he's had to people. Now, I don't know about you, sometimes if I have something unpleasant ahead of me, I might drag my feet getting there, take a little extra time because it's unpleasant. Jesus knows he's going to Jerusalem to die, but he's not wasting time. He's going to arrive, we're going to see in the next couple of weeks, he's going to arrive perfectly on time. His schedule includes an agenda to minister to people and to tell them who he is. And so we're going to see that. But now, now he is in Jericho, today's story. And he's almost at his destination. And he enters Jericho and was passing through, the scripture says. And that's important because he's not there to stay for a while and minister to people. He's on his way through to Jerusalem. But he does stop because he has another appointment. Let me show you Jericho here a couple, little bit. There's really three parts of Jericho. There's a part that's ancient from the time of, of uh, Joshua and the walls falling down. And then there's a, a newer time from the time of Jesus. And then there's the modern days. And you can see the modern city of, Jer of Jericho back there. But this in the foreground, this is actually the hill, or the tell, it's called, where the ancient city of Jericho was. You know, Joshua fought the battle of Jericho, and the walls came tumbling down, right? That's the place. And God had said, 
I'm knocking this down, and it's never going to be rebuilt. And so it's still just a hill of rubble there today from the days of Joshua. And so like Jericho is the world's oldest city. And here's what it would have looked like there in the days of Joshua in the Old Testament, three, 4,000 years ago. There is an inner wall and an upper outer wall, and God collapsed it all. And archaeologically, they have seen. Here are these walls today, and you can see some of the sloped up wall. Now, let me, let me show you a couple other things. We're going to see in the next couple of weeks that Jesus is going to travel from Jerusalem, Jericho, which is way down below sea level, to Jerusalem, which is way up above sea level. He's going to travel 5,000 feet up over the course of just like 30, 35 kilometers. How many of you have ever driven from Hamilton, and everybody wants to go from Hamilton, of course, but how many, how many of you have driven up Highway 6, up the hill of the escarpment on the way back to Guelph? You driven that? Okay. I, I used to have a Volkswagen. It would take me an hour to get up that hill. <laughs> but imagine that hill, okay? Imagine that hill coming up with that steep a slope for 30 kilometers, that's what the road from Jericho to Jerusalem is like. I, I've been in a bus tour there, and other buses and cars, they say, are always by the side of the road with steam coming out, overheating, because it's such a climb. And Jesus is going to make that on this very road over the next couple of weeks we're going to see. But, but I want to go back, because between the ancient city the walls fell, and the modern city is the city of Jericho from the days when Jesus walked there. And you can see, I mean, here is a place where King Herod had a, a summer retreat down there that was an oasis town, and uh, beautiful as they're digging down and finding it, and you can still today walk on the streets where Jesus had walked back in that day. It's pretty amazing stuff. He's walking. The crowd is growing. He's announced that he's the Messiah, and many believe, and they're following him. But what's all happening here in this story? Let me tell you a little bit. Um, well, let's have a look at Zacchaeus in this story, and then later we're going to look at Jesus and compare and contrast the two. Let's talk about Zacchaeus. Ready? Got your pen handy? Number one, he was raised in a religious home. Now, we know that from several different ways. He's raised in a religious home. First, Jesus calls him a, a son of Abraham. So he is a Jew, and he was raised right. And we know his name. It was a man by the name of Zacchaeus. That's a, that's a Hebrew name. It's a Jewish name, and it has a meaning. So we know he's from a good family. And indeed, his name, Zacchaeus, means clean or innocent. So here's a, a good family naming their son, you know, our nice, innocent son, our cute little clean baby, you know. They've given him this lovely name. It's great. But as he grows up, he becomes a tax collector, and he stole money, and he cheated money from people, so he wasn't very liked. So even though his nickname was Mr. Clean... Everybody thought of him as the dirtiest guy in town. Mr. Clean, yeah, right. Now, he was, because of the way he did his business as a tax collector, very successful. Very, very successful. We've seen lots of tax collectors throughout the book of Luke, but he's the first chief tax collector we've seen. He's over other tax collectors. And... That means he's an older man, too, as he's risen up, risen up through the ranks, as we see him. Very successful and very wealthy. How did he get wealthy? Well, cheating people. How wealthy was he? Well, so wealthy that on this very day, he could give away half of his fortune, and he could pay back four times what he had cheated people of and still have plenty to live on. That's a lot. So he's a very, very wealthy guy, and all tax collectors, we read about at least, were like that and became wealthy that way, and he's a chief tax collector, so super wealthy. But because of the way he got his wealth, he had few friends, very few friends. All the tax collectors in that day were hated, and interesting, all the people saw this, Jesus going to his house, 
and began to mutter. They're muttering under their breaths. What do they say? Huh, he's gone to be the guest of a sinner. They hated him. He's the biggest sinner, the biggest cheat in town. Amazing stuff. Now, Zacchaeus as well, and this is just an interesting fact, but it's, it's key to the story. Jeez, Zacchaeus is a short guy. He's short in stature. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he couldn't because of the crowd. He's jumping, and he, he can't see Jesus, so he's got to find another way. Now, how many of you, before I even started, knew that Zacchaeus was a short guy? And how did you know that? I know how you know that. And here's our second kind of fun thing today. Sing along. Okay, sing along from Sunday school. Ready? Can't hear it, Dennis. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And as the Savior passed that way, he looked up in the tree, and he said, Zacchaeus, you, you come, come down. down. Wait. For I'm going to your house today. For I'm going to your house today. Does that bring back memories? All right, everybody join this time. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. Wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And as the Savior passed that way, he looked up in the tree. And he said, Zacchaeus, you come down. Wait. For I'm going to your house today. For I'm going to your house today. Nice. Good job. Good job. That's great. Now, we got some visitors here today. I apologize. You're going, what? This is a song from way back in Sunday school days for many of you who are here. It's great. So we know about Zacchaeus. Now, one more thing about Zacchaeus. He was curious. He was curious about the world. He's so curious that he's curious enough that he leaves his house and he stops counting his money like Scrooge McDuck. And he goes out to see this Mashiach. Who is this Jesus of Nazareth? Is he really the Messiah, the Mashiach of Israel? Is he the guy? See, everybody's heard of Jesus and he wants to see as well. He's curious, but I think he's more than curious. I think when you see what he does and the lengths that he goes to, that he felt something was missing in his life. More than just curious, I think he's desperate. So what does he do? He's missing something in his life. So he, he leaves his house and he goes to see this parade that's going through town. Thousands are there following Jesus and he gets a little caught off guard. I can't see him. The crowd's too thick. And he maybe starts pushing his way through, but nobody's letting Zacchaeus through because they hate him. He's cheated every one of them on their taxes. Nobody wants... Now, he thinks, oh, maybe if I'd have thought earlier, maybe I could have brought a roll of 20s and bribed my way through. But no, 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 no. He does not get through. Do you see him? He's a wee little man. So... He comes up, he can't do it, uh, he can't get through. So this time, instead, he runs ahead, the verse says. He runs ahead and climbs a tree. Now, now this next part is totally voluntary. How many of you, if you're willing to admit it, how many of you would raise your hand and say, I'm 45 or older today? If you're willing, okay? Only if you're 45 and older. Some of the ladies are like this, the men are, yep, that's me. Okay, keep your hand up for a second. Keep your hand up for a second, okay? Everybody 45 and older, if you don't mind. Now, how many of you have climbed a tree in the last two years? <laughs> One, two, three, four, five. Hmm. You see, Zacchaeus, as a chief tax collector, would have been probably 45 or older. Can you picture him? I mean, he's a prominent man. He's a wealthy man. Here's a guy who's influential up in a tree. Up in a tree. He's got lots of pride and lots of money. But I think this shows there's something missing in his life. And he's desperate. So he, he runs ahead and he climbs the tree. 
And I wonder if he's thinking to himself, what am I doing? Remember they had no jeans in those days? So he's climbing this tree with his robe. I mean, he, he climbs and what am I doing here? And it's all to see this Jesus guy that he's heard so much about. And everybody's heard so much about. So, wow. Let me review for a moment what we see. Here's Zacchaeus. Okay, he climbs a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. What do we see about Zacchaeus? He's raised in a religious home. He's successful. He's wealthy. Now he has a few friends. He's short. And he maybe sensed that something was missing in his life. Now before we go on and look at Jesus, I think maybe some of us are a little bit like that. I mean, you just remembered that Zacchaeus was a wee little man song. You were, you were raised in maybe a good religious home. And, and today, you know, things are going fairly well. You're successful compared to most of the people in the world. You're wealthy. you got a house to live in. You probably drove in a car to get here. And, but maybe some of us sense that there's still something missing. There, there's a piece in my life that's not what it should be. Or at least there's, sense that there's a hole. There's something more. Well, I think to answer that, we need to go on to Jesus and take a little bit of a look at Jesus. You see, Jesus was also raised in a religious home, okay? He's so religious indeed, so, so famous that you know his parents even. What are their names? Mary and Joseph. That's right, you know them. Now, so they name him Jesus. Well, actually, an angel told them what to name him, right? Now, None of us probably had an angel tell us what to name our kid, or we'd have picked better names. But Marion, Marion, not my kids, of course. They're wonderful names. It's a religious home. Even an angel tells them what to name Jesus. It's great. So his name is Jesus, but that's English. And it comes from Latin, you know, which is closer to Jesus, which came from Greek, which was Jesus, which came from Hebrew, which is his name, which was Yeshua. So take it the other way around, Yeshua in Greek became Jesus in Latin, which became Jesus in English. And really, his name means, well, he comes into Zacchaeus' house and he says, today salvation has come to this house. And he says that because his name means salvation. His name means salvation, right? So he's actually a little play on words. If Tim and Amy Jennison brought their daughter to your house, they would say, today joy has come to your house because their daughter's name is Joy. And so Jesus is, you know, a little word game here. He walks in and says, salvation has come into your house. His name is salvation. God saves. So he walks in. It's a little bit of a play on words, but more than that, it's important. Jesus is saying, when I come into your house, when I come into your life, I bring salvation for you, if you'll let me in. And that's what he says. In Revelation, we read, he says, he's knocking on the door, and if you open the door, he will come in and live with you. It's amazing stuff. So he's also raised in a religious home. Number two, he wasn't wealthy or successful in the world's view. Not at all. He had no money. Uh, one day, it was his turn to pay some taxes, and so he says to somebody, hey, go down to the water, get a fish. When you open the fish's mouth, there will be a coin in its mouth. Use it to pay my taxes. Who would like to do that? <laughs> that? Wouldn't that be great? Now, the point isn't how he paid his taxes. The point is he didn't even have anything. He had to do a miracle to even pay his taxes. He had no money. He had no position. One day he said to his disciples, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Quite the opposite of Zacchaeus here. Jesus has nothing, but he is extremely popular. He is extremely popular. And if you think it was just Jesus and his 12 merry men, you know, wandering around in the desert, not at all. There were crowds around him. Last week we saw blind Bartimaeus become healed and become a follower of Jesus. And, and this is an, an entourage. This is a crowd. This is, well, it's the streets lined. I mean, when was the last time you saw the streets lined with people who want to see somebody coming and it wasn't Santa Claus, right? When was the last time you saw that? The crowds were waiting for him and wanting him. He's so popular with, popular with people 
but so hated by the religious leaders, so feared by the Romans, but nobody ignores him. He's a big deal in that day. We'll see in a couple of weeks where King Herod can't wait to meet him, and he's heard about all his miracles, and he wants him to do a miracle for him. Jesus is perhaps the most popular person in all of Israel right now. Yet, he's going to die shortly. He's on his way to Jerusalem to die, and he knows it. Now, let me read for you what he just said to his disciples before this. And this is amazing, all right? So Jesus took the 12 aside and told them, now tell me if this sounds clear to you. We are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. He will be handed over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, insult him, spit on him, flog him, and kill him. Does that sound clear to you? Does that sound clear? He couldn't have been more clear, and this isn't the first time he's told him why he's going and what's going to happen. He's popular, but he's going to die. It's amazing. Now, what, what always kills me is, even though Jesus told the disciples this so plainly and so many times, for some reason, the Bible says it was hidden from them. He told them plainly, but they didn't get it. And the more I've thought about this over the years, I really think that maybe this was because if they'd understood it, they would have tried to stop it from happening. Don't you think? Remember, even in the Garden of Gethsemane, the night before Jesus goes to the cross, and Judas and the soldiers come to arrest him, and Peter, who knows where he gets it, pulls out a sword and he starts swinging it around, he chops off somebody's ear, and what does Jesus say to him? Put away your sword. This is the plan. I'm here to die. So they don't get it, but he totally does. He knew, and he still went. By the way, if you were going somewhere and you knew that you were soon going to die, what would be on your mind as you're traveling? Would you be maybe a little bit internally focused? When, how, what's going to happen? What will it be like? Well, not Jesus. Even as he's going to the cross to die for other people, he's still thinking of other people. And he noticed people and even called them by name notices them and calls them by name. When he reached the spot where Zacchaeus was up the tree, he looks up and says, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. Wow. I wonder if Zacchaeus looked around and said, do I have a name tag on? How does, how does he know me? I mean, is Zacchaeus known beyond Jericho? I doubt it. But Jesus walks into still another town and looks into the heart and mind of still another person and knows what they're thinking and and calls him by name. And though he's on his way to die, he stops because he's got an appointment. I'm going to your house today. And it's a very important appointment, not to judge, but to love. Not to judge this person everybody in town called a sinner, said Mr. Clean is the dirtiest guy around, but to love him. You see, Jesus had an agenda, and he stuck to it, because that agenda was to help people who were willing find a life worth living. Zacchaeus, I must stay at your house today. And then he finishes this passage with the key verse of the whole book of Luke. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. He came to to look for and change people who were willing to be changed for God. He didn't go to Zacchaeus and say, you're the biggest cheat in town. He didn't do that, no. He said, I want to come and stay with you for a while. I wonder how many in that town had ever had lunch with Zacchaeus. They all hated him. Nobody wanted to be around him for sure. But Jesus, he's going through town once. And he knows his timetable, and he stops and says, I want to go to your house. What's Jesus' agenda? 
Well, many of you, even if you're visiting today, even if you're just seeking more spiritually in your life, have probably heard of one of the most famous verses in the Bible, John 3, 16. And uh, why don't you take a moment and read it with me, because this certainly tells us the agenda of Jesus. Let's read it together. What does it say? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. There's Jesus' agenda to come to this world, to take on flesh and blood, to die, so that if we believe in him, we trust him, please forgive my sins, we'll have eternal life. But I wonder how many of us know the next verse. Verse 17, because there it says that God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world, but to save the world through him. And that's what Jesus came to do. That's who Jesus is. He, he doesn't accept sin. He condemns it. But he accepts people and loves them. And that's what he does here. He loves you so much that he wants you to love you so that you sense that love and want to change. Change. How did Zacchaeus change? Well, when he met Jesus, he found a new purpose for his life. And it changed him dramatically. Changed him dramatically. So Zacchaeus stood up. I wonder if you could still see him. He stands up and he's still short. And he said to the Lord, look, See, now look, he's saying, you can count on this. Look, Lord. Oh, he calls Jesus Lord. What has been his Lord before this? Money. So the first thing he does is, you can count on this. You are the Lord. Look, Lord, here and now. Not someday. Here and now, I give half my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I'll pay back four times the amount. I, I wonder about the crowds that are around watching this. The people of Jericho saw this man who had been a miser and had cheated every one of them out of their money, now giving half his fortune to the poor. I mean, who is this man? What happened to Zacchaeus? Holy cow. Look, Lord, he says. Look, I mean this. And I'm going to do it right now. Lord, See, I want you to know something. Giving away his money did not save him. Okay? Giving away his money is not what saved him. But meeting Jesus face to face and making Jesus the Lord of his life is what saved him. Everybody catch that? But once Jesus is in your life and you're doing things his way, it really changes how you treat your money and your time, and the people around you. Amen? It's after he has said, Lord, that he says, now I'm giving everything that I've taken, that I've cheated, I'm making restitution, I'm giving to the poor. And he's saved by making Jesus Lord. And then his life changes, and his generosity begins. So, what about you? This morning, do you need a new purpose? I mean, what consumes your thoughts? What do you spend your money on most? What, do you need a new purpose in life? Is there something missing in life? Are you thinking, boy, there's just, things feel kind of empty for me. Who do you call Lord? Or maybe more importantly, what do you call Lord? What takes up your time, your thoughts, your money, what, what takes up these things? Or maybe, how do you picture Jesus now? Did you walk in thinking of God as this ogre ready to rain on the parade and spoil the fun and smite you and, and condemn you? I saw that, I saw that. Or what do you think of Jesus now, why he came? Do you see him in a different way? Now, I know the Holy Spirit works differently in everyone's heart. And even in the, the same sermon here this morning, 
He can work differently in every heart. Matter of fact, I've preached uh, sometimes and had people come out and say, I really loved when you said this. And I thought, I never said that. But God took something and ran with it in somebody's mind. And you know, today, we all come from different works. We all come from different homes. We all come from a different week, and we've got different things in our mind. So there's always a different message to each one of us. And I don't know what God's message is to you this morning. If one of these questions is just for you, or maybe a different one for each, about purpose, or, or finding that thing that's missing, or, or what's really first and Lord in your life. And I don't know what the message is to do to you today, but, and maybe it's even none of my business. But I'll dare to say that you'd be foolish to not stop and consider what God's message is to you today and say, God, what should I do? It's between you and him. Let's take a moment and be quiet before him. Maybe look at the questions. But just quietly talk to God. Do that. Allow me to lead you in prayer. Our Father, I thank you that you've taught us again that Jesus didn't come to condemn, but to love. And some of us who've been Christians a long time need to hear that because we need to do more loving and less condemning. Help us. And help us have that balance of loving people, but not accepting sin. And Father, some of us here today have something missing, and they're not sure what it is in their life. And I pray that now and in this coming week, you'll reveal yourself in a very practical way. And thank you for your ability to change us in a very dramatic way if we would let you in the areas where we know we need a transformation. God, please give us the power to become the loving people you changed us to be with you as our Lord. I pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Amen.